Amen. All right, we're reading out of Luke this morning. I titled my message, Can You See? And we're reading out of Luke chapter 18. We're going to read 8. We're going to read Luke 18, 9 through 17. Then we're going to read Luke 18, 18 through 27. Is that thunder? It's a huge storm coming through. A huge storm coming through. You're going to have soggy crawfish. <laughs> It's not going to last long. Yeah. Amen. Oh, cool. All right. Luke 18, 9 through 17. Let's read. He spoke this parable unto certain, basically certain people, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went into the temple to pray. Let's just stop for a second. I know I do this all the time. I don't play off my up. Too bad. But basically what they're telling us right here is, is that, He's speaking this parable. Now, I know that I've taught this in the, in the past. We've talked about Proverbs. We've talked about the word parable. In the Greek, this, this word is based on two Greek words, para, below. Para means side, below means ball. Where we get the word ball means to throw. You throw two things alongside one another for the purpose of comparison and contrast. Jesus is about to compare and contrast the difference between the religious minded person that thinks that he's righteous because of what he does versus a person whose heart is broken in the presence of God and humbles himself. All right. And so that's what he's telling this whole parable for. He says two men went up to the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee. The other, a publican. That's a King James Version word for tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. Now, in, the, in this time frame, publicans, tax collectors were well known. They were Jewish people. So theoretically, they were the people of God. But these people... Did not what they did was they extorted their own people to gain more money from Rome or, or for Rome from the people. And so they had a job and they got paid, but if they could get more money from the people, they could line their own pockets and they were famous for doing that. So they were hated by their own people they, and they were connected many times as pro, to, to the prostitutes. They were considered the worst of sinners because they did their own people dirty. And so we're seeing this particular uh, situation. But one of the things that I want you to see there also is, is that these people thought that they were righteous the people that Jesus is talking to, and they despised others in their own eyes. You know, the truth be told is that each and every one of us have experienced this to some extent. I don't care. I don't care how long you've been in the faith. You may not be able to see it, but I'm telling you right now, at some point in time, if you're truly saved, self-righteousness gripped your heart. Self-righteousness has gripped your heart and made you think in your own mind that when you compared yourself to someone else, you thought you were better than they were. Because, and listen, I used to sit in the back of the church and I shared this with you before that, you know, I literally used to think this. Am I proud of it? No, I'm not. I'm going to tell you things that go on inside my mind. Many of people will not come out and tell you things that go on inside their mind, but I used to sit in in church and I used to think hmm look at me I mean I got two hands up oh boy over there I only got one he must not really now did it, I'm trying to tell you that the thought entered my mind okay look at look at me how I worship the Lord as opposed to this poor guy over here he's not doing what it was. now you might not have gone that far with it you might but there has been something that has entered into your mind where you looked at someone else despised others looked down upon others because they didn't do what you did, yet you thought you were more righteous with the Lord because of what you did compared to what they did. So this is a parable for each and every one of us. It's not just for the tax collector. I'm sorry. It's not just for the, for the Pharisee who was a religious leader, right? It's for each and every one of us. So this is what, the, this is what he, he said. He said, I fast twice a week. Look, look at what I do. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. And they brought unto him also infants that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called unto them, them unto him and said, suffer little children to come unto me. In other words, don't prevent the little children from coming to me. 
And then he uses this analogy. He says, and forbid them not for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily, I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. So Jesus is explaining to his you know, really his disciples are the ones that don't want the children being brought. And we'll get into that in a second. But I wanted to just mention a statement that Jesus made in there. Jesus said that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Now, we don't want to get into, don't, don't let the thunder worry. We're okay. God's got this. Amen. 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 Uh, even if it gets dark in here, if Matthew Darby can preach in the dark, I can too. Right? Amen. So, listen, he says everyone that, ex he says that this man went home justified. Now, the New Testament concept of justified means that you've been declared innocent by God. You've Amen. been made right standing with God. The way that Jesus said that this happened was because he humbled himself. This man humbled himself and because of that went home justified. The Bible also says that he was he was abased. That's literally what the word means to be abased. It means to humble self. So what you see is, is that the other guy sees himself elevated, lifted up, right? Have you ever seen have you ever seen even preachers like that? Mm -hmm. Hopefully you don't see that in me. I mean, I'm not saying that I've ever <laughs> exhibited any of that type of behavior, but I've seen plenty of preachers that they carry themselves with an air of yeah. self-righteousness. Yeah. I've seen plenty of people, in, especially in big churches. I've been part of big churches before. In people in music ministry. That, that carry themselves and really a little bit too good for the normal folk. Mm -hmm. Don't even really want to rub shoulders with normal folk. Yep. There's a problem with that. You, you have a problem in your heart if you think of yourself as being better than someone else. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. I'm just telling you the truth. Jesus would not act that way. Jesus hung out with prostitutes. Jesus hung out with tax collectors. Why? Because he came to seek and to save the lost. Amen. He didn't come just to hang out, rub shoulders with the people that were the coolest in the church. That dressed the way that he thought he people ought to be dressed. Anyway, that's another story. All right, let's look at Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 27. So what I want you to notice is this is happening right on the heels of this parable. I've said this before, too. Whenever you read the New Testament, especially the Gospels, and you're studying. This is more for whenever you're studying, okay? I like to mention different little teaching techniques so that whenever you're studying, it can help you out a little bit. When you're reading the Gospels, you should always, and, you, and something of interest hits you, and you're like, man, what's up with this? You know, the Lord's speaking to you. You know, God speaks through His Word. If you open yeah. it up, He will speak to you through His Word. When you're reading the New Testament Gospels and something like that hits you, you should go back and read the previous chapter and at least the chapter afterwards, and you should try to see if there's any interconnection. Remember how I told you that God is a, is a literary genius? The Gospels are a perfect example of that. There are things that are lying under, right under the surface that many times we don't put them all together. This is one of those examples. This is not an accident. This rich young ruler coming up and asking right on the heels of this parable that was just spoken is not an accident. It's an illustration to what we just heard, right? It says a certain ruler. That just means an elevated official, okay? And we know that he has money because the Bible tells us he does. Asked him, talking about Jesus, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Now, people have taken this to say Jesus was saying he wasn't God. That's not what's going on here. This terminology, the idea is, is that the Jewish people, whenever they would use that word master like that, it was elevating. It was saying, putting someone on the level of God. Jesus knew that. He's saying, why are you calling me God? But yet at the same time, he knew what was in his heart. And if, in other words, if you think I'm God, why don't you just do what I say? Yep. And so Jesus was letting him know, no, you're not, you know, you're not right, basically, is what's going on here. You know the commandments. He says, not, why do you call me good? None is good, save one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. He said, all these I've kept from my youth. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, you lack just one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute unto the poor. You shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. 
you know, real quick, I just want to say this too. That's the beautiful thing about salvation. When you get saved, listen to me, when you get saved, the book of Ephesians says this, that you that the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. You receive a down payment of the Holy Spirit. Salvation in the New Testament is a completely different situation. That's the beauty of it. You can't live according to a set of rules and laws and regulations. That's not the way the New Testament rule is expected to take place. There, Jesus sits here and lists off all of these commandments. And this old boy is like, yep, I've been doing that all since the days of my youth. But Jesus' whole purpose in all of this, he purposefully left out covetousness. He purposely left out covetousness and didn't even give the man a chance because he knew that was the very thing that he was dealing with. The point that I'm trying to make is this, is that we can make a long list. And many times that's what people in the New Testament church want. Many times people in the church want the preacher to give them a list of the things that they can do and the things that they can't do. That's not how the New Testament works. That's not how salvation works. Jesus died on the cross to give us access to the presence of God. You become the temple of God. The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. He begins to deal with the, with the minute details of our lives. He begins to reveal and to shine light on those details in the midst of our lives. He begins to show us the very areas that need to come into, it, it, into balance or to the right place, right? So Jesus ends up telling you like just one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute unto the poor. And you shall have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. When he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle eye, a needle's eye, than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? Now his disciples are the ones that are really hearing this. Who then can be saved? He said, the things which are impossible with men are impossible with God. Now, what I did was I went back and I looked at all the stories. Really, I started off with Zacchaeus. I'm going to be honest with you. I felt like God felt like I was going to preach on Zacchaeus. I went and read the story of Zacchaeus, but then I went back like I told you. And I, what, I, what I noticed was is that all of these stories that surround this parable are interconnected, right? And provide an illustration about the parable that Jesus gave regarding the Pharisee and the tax collector, the rich young ruler, the children that are brought to him, the blind beggar. He's in the midst of this. Blind Bartimaeus, Zacchaeus, all have elements that apply to the parable in contrast with the actions of the rich young ruler. So we see that what Jesus was talking about is if people are elevated, then that's contrary to what the word of God says. But the rich young ruler shows up and he is, he's, he's, he, in his own mind, he's elevated compared to and does not want to come into line with God's plan. Real quick, I just want to say regarding the blind beggar, because I'm not going to go back and read all those, those passages of scripture for the sake of time. But just to remind you regarding the blind beggar, Jesus and his disciples were journeying through Jericho. Y'all remember the story? And there was blind Bartimaeus. There were actually two blind men there, but the one that we're told his name, blind Bartimaeus. Okay. Now, one of the things that I, that I was going to tell you is, is that, and I may spell it wrong because you know that the King James has different ways that you can spell stuff, but you get, you get the point that I'm trying to make. So this word right here, I know sometimes we get into it deep, but it's a, it's a point that I want to make. You ever heard of Simon Bar Jonah? Yes. That's, that's Peter, his name. Simon was his first name. Jesus changed it to Peter, Petros Rock. His last name, his surname was Jonah. It, what it means is Simon, son of Jonah. So what Bartimaeus' name means is son of Timaeus. Now the word Timaeus means unpure or defiled. So essentially what this word of God is saying is that Bartimaeus is the son of the unpure. Now, symbolically, this is a type of the first birth in Adam. You and I are sons of Adam and our first births were born unpure. What I'm trying to tell you is you don't have to follow along with me if you don't want to. But the word of God is a treasure. God is a literary genius. And if you'll dig deep enough, you can never exhaust the same message that God is speaking time and again. Man born to Adam in his first birth is born, un is born defiled. He's born polluted. He's born in the midst of sin. And because of that, he is blind. 
Mankind, like Bartimaeus, is stuck on the side of the road. He's blind. He cannot see. Bartimaeus is in a situation that he is helpless and he is hopeless. But he hears good news. Hallelujah. He hears good news that Jesus is coming through the midst of town. He says, D Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, we don't have time to get into the fact that he's calling him Messiah, son of David, the promised one. Jesus, have mercy on me. What do the disciples do? Hush. Mm -hmm. He's a little too good for you. Elevate it. Listen, this problem isn't just with the young ruler. This problem is with Jesus' disciples himself. They have a problem on the inside of their heart of self-righteousness and they see themselves as elevated and they don't feel as though a rich little beggar. Listen to me, this might be confusing for you, but for the longest time in my life, even as a child, by seeing these paintings of Paul and Peter with these little halos around their head, I'm over here thinking, man, look how holy they are. The reality of it is, I don't mean to get too deep on you, that's a cultic. Yes. That's called the sun disc. That comes back from ancient Babylonian religion. And he had no halos over their head. The reality of it is, is that if you read about the disciples, they were people just like you and me that needed Jesus. And that there were things in the midst of their heart. Come on. Whenever the sons of thunder went to Jesus, what did they say? They don't, want us to, they don't want us to come through here because of the fact that, you know, come through Samaria because of the fact that uh, they know we're going to Jerusalem. You want us to call down fire from heaven on them? Jesus said, you don't even know what spirit you're of. He was, because he was in the same location as whenever um, Elijah called down fire from heaven, and which ultimately destroyed the prophets of Baal. They're like, we're in the same spot as we were then. Let's do it again. Elijah called down prophets. The point being is, is that even God's people, yeah. might not, we might not be able to see it always, but even God's people have things on the inside of them. <clears throat> and they're over here, his disciples are telling Listen, Jesus is a little too good for you. This entourage right here, I mean, I know I'm, I'm embellishing, but I'm just trying to make a point. This entourage right here is not for you. <laughs> you just need to hush and be quiet. He didn't listen to them. Don't listen to religion. Amen. Whenever religion stands in the way of what God wants to do in, the, in your life and in your heart, don't listen to religion. Listen, there's been times in my life when the Lord got a hold of me that I was excited about the things of God and wanted to talk to people about the Lord. And I was shutting down by people that were supposedly elevated and religious over me. And the Lord, thank God, spoke to my heart and said, there's people that do not understand what I'm doing in you. And you can't get bitter by them. But listen to me. What the son of Timaeus did was he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. I'm broken. I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. And I need you to intervene in the midst of my life. I'm blind and I cannot see. God wants people to see. Look, Zacchaeus, the interesting thing about him is, and I'm not going to go write it, but his name meant pure. He is a tax collector. How can he be pure? He's the dirtiest of the dirty. But it's almost like Jesus tells the story of the tax collector knowing what will happen to Zacchaeus in the next chapter. Here's a man that would have been despised by the people, but he would have been an official. He would have been very wealthy. Who knows how he responded so rapidly to the gospel? I don't know how he did, but it's almost like it makes you wonder. This is speculation, but it makes you wonder... Was he a previous associate of Matthew? You know, Matthew, the disciple that was a tax collector, Levi. I don't know that he was, but is it possible? And that he heard the story that Matthew just he shut it all down. And he went and he followed Jesus. But oh, one thing before I go, Zacchaeus, I want to let you know I'm going to follow Jesus. I don't know if that's what happened. I can tell you that is how it happens. I can tell you that from the time frame of the disciples, even until today, that is exactly how human beings get saved. That's how they're supposed to get saved. Not that we make the church look like the world and make the world comfortable to come into the world, but that instead the gospel message of Jesus Christ goes out and here it lands upon hurting ears. And listen, it doesn't always happen that moment in that time. But listen to me, from time to time. God will bring those words of wisdom back up, those seeds that have been planted on the inside of the heart, amen, and at some point in time, bring that person to a place of brokenness and despair to where they cry out to the Lord. How many times did I remember the words of my sister, Sister Toot, since being a child and even going my own way and traveling, and you know that what I'm trying to tell you, the same thing happened to each and every one of you. 
I don't really know what the situation was, but like a child, he takes off running. Because he was a short, he was a wee little man. And he couldn't see. The blind man can't see. I'm about to get to it, but the rich young ruler can't see. Zacchaeus can't see. Zacchaeus was desperate to see. He ran ahead like a little child. This is a ludicrous situation. A rich, wealthy official running them short little legs, moving as fast as he possibly can, climbing up in a tree like a child, almost looking to go see some kind of a circus or a parade just so he could get a glimpse of the master. And Jesus sees him and he says, I'm coming to your house today. There, this is the only place in the New Testament where Jesus says, I'm going to invite himself to somebody's house. But yet in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, to the church of Laodicea, he says, I stand on the outside and I knock. And if any man would open up his heart, his door, me and my father will come in and sup with him. That day, Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' heart, to house. But listen to me, immediately when that happens, Zacchaeus starts, and I'm going to read it later on. Zacchaeus starts saying, I'll give back fourfold. Anything that I took improperly, I'll give back fourfold. It's as though Jesus was knocking, not just saying, I'm coming to your house, but I'm coming into your yes, house, the yes. temple. And when, and when Zacchaeus was ready to receive it, a transformation miracle took oh. place on the inside. The New Testament, the new covenant, the message of the cross where the old man dies and a new man is resurrected was birthed on the inside of Zacchaeus and he was transformed. But the rich young ruler... Is, is different. He doesn't really want to lose himself in order to enter the kingdom of God. He could not see. These other guys couldn't see. The rich young ruler couldn't see. This is a common thought in the Bible. God wants people to be able to see, right? In the beginning, God said, let there be light. Yeah. He provided a pillar of fire at night so that they could see where they were going. I'm talking about in the Exodus. David said that God's word in Psalm 119 is a light to the path and a lamp to the feet. There was a lamp in the temple so that they could see to do the work of God. And Jesus was the light of the world. There's also a reference to the word serving as a mirror in the Old Testament, right? In the labor. We've talked on this many times. If this is your first time, I'm going to make it quick. I'm going to make it simple. The articles at the tabernacle. Y'all remember there was an altar of sacrifice. After that, there was something called a bronze labor. After that, you went into the tabernacle. We're just going to focus on the bronze labor. It was a place where the high priest, where the priest would wash, walk, wash himself. I say that weird word, wash himself. The Bible says in the King James Version that it was made, that the base of it was made from the looking glasses of the women. That wasn't glass back then, but it was a reflective metal. The inside of that bronze laver of this wash basin was made from reflective mirror. Why? So that whenever the high, when the priest, sorry, would look to wash himself, he could see himself. It's a type of the Word of God. When you read the Word of God, the reflection of the work of God is in the Word of God. When the priest would go down to wash himself, any blood that was splattered from the killing of the animal was on his face. There's a reflection in the Word, just like there was a reflection in the water that, re that reminds us of the Word of God. You see the, de the devastation of sin and the cause, the, the result that it causes death. And as this priest on a daily basis is having to kill these animals in order to assuage the wrath of God, when he looks into the labor, he sees both the sin and the result of sin, but he also sees the redeeming work of God. That's what the Word of God does. It's a reflection of the work of God. And when you look into it, that's what God's Word speaks. So it provides not just light, but it also is like a mirror. That's what James said. James 1, 23 through 24. The title of my message this morning is, Can You See? James says, If there be a hearer, if any be a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Talking about a mirror, a reflection. For he beholds himself and goes away and straightway, immediately, that's what it means, forgets what manner of man he was. Jesus used the law in the young ruler. We said a blind Bartimaeus couldn't see, Zacchaeus couldn't see, but the rich young ruler couldn't see either. Jesus wanted to try to help him see and use the law to try to explain what was going on. And he mentions covet, he mentions adultery, he mentions 
these other things and he doesn't see. Well, then Jesus said, well, there's just one little thing that you're lacking. See, I personally believe as I was reading this, I was thinking, this may be, I don't want, I, I sometimes I'm getting, I probably shouldn't go here, but just to let you know, in the book of Acts, remember how it says they sold everything and they distributed amongst themselves? I'm telling you right now, this word that Jesus gave to this rich young ruler influenced the people in the book of Acts. Don't get me wrong, I believe they were doing it with all of my heart. From the, as the Spirit of God moved upon their hearts, that they didn't feel as though they had to hold on to their own stuff. But Jesus does not require that every single human being sell everything that he has and distribute it evenly amongst all the poor people that he has. There's a lot of rich people. I mean, I've never personally met him, but Hobby Lobby dude, he's like born again Christian. Chick fil A dude's born again Christian, and they give back a lot. But to say that they've sold everything that they had and distributed, no. The point being is, is that many times this is the area of problem within a person's heart. That's the whole point to salvation is the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. He picks out. The preacher can't pick out for you what's going on in your heart and in your life of where you need change. The Holy Spirit does that for each and every one of us. Amen. And, and, and Jesus didn't mention covetousness, but he asked him to do something that a covetous person wouldn't want to do. The rich young ruler is contrasted with both the blind beggar and Zacchaeus. Once again, the blind beggar is physically blind. He's helpless. He's hopeless. He sits by the road waiting for something to happen because he can't change his situation or circumstance. And it's just like you and I. That first birth, son of the unpure, can't help ourselves, sitting there dependent upon the Lord to do something. Zacchaeus too short. Can't accomplish it. Can't get it done. But he wants to see Jesus. The differences that are shown are that people that are really want to see and people that don't. In other words, there's people that want to see and people that don't. And people that really do want to see, I'm telling you, and they cry out to the Lord and they ask God to give them eyes to see. God will show up. Amen. And do the work. That was point number one. Point number one was, did I even say it? He couldn't see. The rich young ruler couldn't see. Point number two, and this is a point that I probably preach almost every message. We must decrease so that he can increase. Amen. Right? right? The cross is death to self. Or salvation is a new birth. When we talk about the mindset of we must decrease so that he might increase. Everything that we see about the Lord is so different than what, than what we are. Do you not agree with that? Mm -hmm. yeah. The mindset of the world is that you got to get what you got coming to you because if you don't, then the world's going to snake you and take it from you. Yeah. So you got to be one step ahead of what the world does. Right. Have you ever worked with people that try to make themselves look good so, by making you look bad? Yes. No. That's what the world will do. But that in the kingdom of God, that's not how it works. In the kingdom of God, you lay self down and you trust the Lord because you understand that he's the one that gives. That he exalts the humble, like he said in the parable. We talk about the fact, all the, or at least I do, that Jesus was born in a manger. That means something. The king of kings and lord of lords was born in a manger amongst stinky animals, amongst manure. He wasn't born in a palace with gold and marble and whatever the case. He rode in a town on a donkey and not a white stallion. He's coming back on a white stallion, but he rode in a town on a donkey. A king on a donkey. There's meaning to that. I don't mean to be rude, but I'm just going to say it like it is, and I'll, we're going to leave this on the tape. Je I heard this on WWL. I listen to this w WWL, 870, talk radio, whatever, whatever. I listen to that sometimes. News, yep. sports. I'm driving down the road, going to work. I'm listening to WWL, and they just happen to mention a local preacher, Jesse Duplantis. Mm -hmm. And you do what you want with that. You love Jesse. You want to follow after Jesse's <coughs> doctrine. That's on you. That's between you and the Lord. But I'm here to tell you, the Word of Faith movement, you got to be careful of that stuff. Because, listen, mm -hmm. they tell, they're trying to tell you that the Apostle Paul will be driving a Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. And don't, don't think that that's ludicrous, because I'm about to tell you what Jesse Duplantis said. He wanted his congregation to give him, I, one, I'm just going to throw a number out there, 27 point something million dollars or something like that. 54 million. Y'all heard it too. 54 million dollars so that he could buy a jet. Why? Did y'all remember that? Because he said that if Jesus was here today, he wouldn't be riding no donkey. 
to get where he was going. Did you miss the point, dude? I think you did. It's all like, oh, but we'll flock to Jesse. We'll buy all of his curriculum. We'll buy all of his stuff. And we'll just love his teaching. And he's over here teaching something that is completely contrary to the whole concept of the word of God. That God would prepare a plan, hallelujah, where he would call a man named Abraham out. And through that man, he would create a nation. And that through that nation, he would allow the, the, the son of God to be born in a manger amongst stinky animals and to ride in a town on a donkey for the whole purpose to show us, like John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he might increase because we self, I get in the way of the plan of God. When you get saved, then something happens. The old man born of Adam dies. God's not into rehab. So don't try to mix theology with psychology and try to paint it up, put lipstick on a pig, and try to act like if this is what God is okay with. No, that's not how God works. God doesn't rehab stuff. He kills things. He allows things to die so that he can now replace it with resurrection life. That's what God does. That's what he's always done. That's what he'll always do. And any man can come and any preacher can come and he can try to change the plan of God. He can try to introduce new music into the church. Try to sit here and convince us that this is what the word of God is. But listen to me. If we go back to the word, what we're going to see repeatedly, mankind has gone his own way. Mankind is going the way that is opposite of what God would do. God has a plan, and that plan is to kill that old man and to resurrect a new man. He's going to put his spirit on the inside of that new man, and on the inside of that new man now, he's going to be a partaker with the divine nature of God. That's what it says in 1 Peter. I'm now a partaker. What does that mean? Joint union with. I'm working in partnership with God. The Holy Ghost lives on the inside of me, and he's changing me on the inside, and it's becoming reflective on the outside. That's how the Word of God works. I, I know what I'm on a, on a side note, but good, give me a break, dude. Really? And how many people do you believe that thought that sounded good? That's horrendous. It's completely contrary to the, old, the whole teaching of the Bible. Yet how many gullible people were like, yeah. touch not mine anointed. I'll tell you what John Collier said. We ain't even close to that yet, baby. In other words, just because a man stands behind a pulpit, and I'm not trying to say that I'm over here to be appointed of God, but what I'm trying to tell you is this. Just because a man stands behind a pulpit and preaches a message does not call him the anointed of God. That's right. God's anointing rests upon someone. Listen to me. The enemy will anoint people too. Is that what you, That's not what I'm saying. All I'm trying to say is just because somebody preaches don't make them the anointed of God. That's right. That's right. Amen. Just vessels. That's it. I'm going too long again this morning, but you know, I remember one time I went to go visit. I'm going to do it. Uh, I went to go visit Josh and Chris at the Bible college that they went to. And I was sitting in this car, and I drove all the way to Columbus, Texas. I'm sitting in this car, and I don't know nothing about the Word of God. I'm probably one of those selfish, carnal Christians that you ever want to meet. Maybe I still am, Lord help me. But I'm sitting in this car and I'm watching this preacher walk and they got two guys on the side of him and one of them's got an umbrella and the other one's holding his Bible. <laughs> and I'm thinking in the middle of my heart, they got something wrong with this picture. <laughs> this dude, is this even for real? <laughs> the little bit that I know about the Bible is that it's the sword. Yeah. We're supposed to be soldiers. And you are carrying his weapon. How are you going to fight on the battlefield? <laughs> Something was wrong with that picture, but that was the whole idea. I'm the anointed of God. And now I've showed up. Don't talk. Like, there used to be a preacher that I knew. I went to go ask him a question before service one time. Don't disturb the anointing. <laughs> Look, dude, if I had to deal with that, you don't even want me to tell you. Okay. Okay. Do you realize how many things happen in the course of a day on a Wednesday afternoon before you even got to go to preach? That's why I like the fact that I got a real job because, listen, I was telling somebody the other day. There used to be times before Bible study that I'm telling you 50 patients would show up. I'm like, the devil's trying to beat me down. He's trying to make me quit. I am not going to quit. Hallelujah. And then all kind of conflict and trial and tribulation happening. 
knowing, though, but that God would give you endurance and he would strengthen you. Every Listen, time. If, Amen. if one little bad thing happened, it's going to mess up the anointing. I ain't had the anointing to begin with. And it's right. not my anointing to begin with. Like you said, it's the word of God that is anointed. He's just looking for a clay vessel, born clay, by the way, fallen, born in the image of Adam, that would be willing to speak his truth Amen. to a lost and dying world. It's his word that's anointed. All right, that's another story. We must decrease so that he can increase. Right? Praise God. His disciples had a hard time understanding the comment that Jesus made about it being hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because in the mind of the Jew, a rich person was blessed by God. That is the mind of a lot of people. Jesse Duplantis, the word, the whole word of faith movement. As a matter of fact, if you're not blessed and wearing the right clothes and driving the right cars, I've heard stories of Word of Faith preachers that go to a conference and they literally stop and they go rent a Cadillac to drive up there so that they look like, dude, that is a, you're an imposter. You're a poser. What in the world is going on? Anyway, I can't even think that way. I'm glad that I can't. But in the mind of the Jew, God blesses his people. Jesus says something different. He says that people that trust in themselves won't make it. Unfortunately, many rich people trust in their own selves and their own riches instead of the Lord. The disciples would have elevated the rich young ruler, but they told the beggar to hush and they rebuked the people for bringing the children to Jesus. Right? This is point number three. Point number two was we got to decrease so that he can increase. Point number three. When there is a change, there is more than words. I'm not trying to tell you there's perfection. Each and every one of us know that God's still working on me, right? It took him, how's it go? It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars. But he's still working on me, <laughs> right? That's, that's, that's a big truth right there. A simple little song like that. That's the gospel. See what I'm saying? We can get up here and sing that song. We'd be singing the gospel. The rich young ruler said that he had followed certain commandments that Jesus listed since he was a child. But when it came to the one that he had problems with, he held on to that instead of grabbing a hold of God. Zacchaeus, on the other hand, he had a heart change. You see how I'm saying all of these are interconnected is because you have people that are elevated and refuse to humble themselves. You have people that humble themselves and don't want to elevate themselves. You got this story of the children in the midst of it all. Zacchaeus acting like a child, running, right? You got people that are blind and can't see spiritually and both physically. And you got Zacchaeus acting like a little kid, so excited that he's going to get a glimpse of the Lord. Amen. And Jesus said that unless you become like a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But in Luke chapter 19, verses 7 through 10, we're going to close with this. This is after Zacchaeus is up in the tree. This is after Jesus says, <coughs> Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. And all of a sudden he hops down and he's, he, the Bible says, when they saw it, they all murmured. Who's they? The crowd? When the crowd saw the, the, the transaction that just took place, Zacchaeus breaking through the crowd, climbing up in the tree, Jesus making the comment, and then Zacchaeus getting back down, what did the crowd, the crowd start murmuring? Talking trash. How, how many times have you, you ever tried to witness to somebody? It's kind of like, it, it, that, that time that I was trying to get excited and that preacher shut me down to, he, that was basically what he was doing. He was murmuring. How many times have you tried to share your testimony with somebody else and they just murmured and complained? Because why? They looked at your past and they didn't feel like they were, oh Lord, if that person now all of a sudden got religion, yeah, whatever. They're fortunate, unfortunately for them, they're blind and they can't see. They're like the rich young ruler. To give them to give them a little bit of slack. They can't see. They don't have spiritual eyes, right? And you, you should expect. That's what I learned from that, tra that little <clears throat> transaction that I had with that preacher when the Lord spoke to my heart. I learned that not everybody's going to be excited when God does a work in your heart. Right. That many times people are going to be envious and jealous of certain aspects of your life. Right. And that they don't even understand why. Truth be told, that the devil will use people in the church just as much as he will use people in the world. Right. And sadly, many times people in the church don't even realize that they're being used as a weapon of the enemy to try to fr cause frustration in your life yep. and to try to, to tr trip you up, right? Zacchaeus had a heart change. So when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was going to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. 
They were belly aching about Jesus. <laughs> and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore to him fourfold. That was what the law required. Jesus said unto him, This day of salvation come to your house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the son of man is to come to seek and to save that which is lost in the place. Jesus said that, a, that the well don't need a physician. He was talking to the Pharisees who were self-righteous. He said the well don't need a physician. It's the sick people that need one. Jesus came for those like Zacchaeus that could see that there was something fundamentally that was wrong with them. Zacchaeus humbled himself while the rich young ruler wanted to elevate himself. And what happened was is that there was something more than words that happened. In Zacchaeus' life, That's right. there was a transformation that took place. The words also were manifest with actions.